The Revolutionary Internationalist Socialist and Environmentalist Party, or more commonly known as RISE, was founded in September 2019 by former members of the Socialist Party, but more notably current party TD Paul Murphy. Ideologically speaking, the party would be described as a mix of democratic socialism and eco-socialism, and currently occupies one seat in Dáil Éireann. In this episode, I sat down with a young member of RISE, Kieran McAvoy, to ask what got him interested in politics and the RISE party. Perfect. Thanks, Millie and Kieran, for joining me today. Uh, first of all, uh, for yourself, what initially sparked your interest in politics? Well, I mean, kind of for nearly all my life, I've been political in some way. Like I've just been in denial about it for the longest time. Like, uh, like kind of personally, it feels like it's nearly impossible to witness kind of the effects of austerity in your community without being politicized in some way. Like even if you kind of you're like me and you actively kind of despise it, like. For the longest while I was very cynical of politics as a whole and I thought that like actual change was pretty much impossible. Like I kind of retreated from anything vaguely political and just kind of focused on things like I felt I had actual control over and got enjoyment out of, which was basically just listening to the same three albums over and over. <laughs> but kind of like I, I found myself in a situation where I, would, I hung out in very apolit- apolitical communities. I just kind of completely shut off and kind of over the past few years I've kind of come out of that state of apathy. And this is around for three main reasons, kind of repeal, climate change and Mark Fisher. Like uh, reading up on the repeal campaign essentially kind of snapped me out from the privilege haze I was viewing politics from. Like it was very easy for me as a lad to completely just opt out from anything political. But I kind of realized that wasn't the case for those who were in mother and baby homes or those who had to fly out to the UK for an abortion. And like the major difference in my area between and how people were voting kind of the presence of the campaigns kind of spurred me on towards actually kind of using my voice like I felt like I couldn't just like passively shrug at things anymore without feeling kind of culpable mm-hmm. and kind of climate change was major in getting me involved in politics like it led to me very quickly learning the importance of like actually organizing like the utter starkness of the climate science is pretty much impossible for me to ignore as we've all kind of found out over the past few months and kind of seeing the uh, the starts of climate strikes was really motivational for me. And now this is probably the weirdest part of my answer, but around like 2018, 2019, I was just obsessed with the writing of Mark Fisher, who's this like a uh, British cultural theorist that people are really insufferable about online. Like it felt like his work very accurately captured a lot of what I was feeling at the time and kind of diagnosed the apathy I felt. Like obviously he's a man of the left, but I feel like most involved in youth politics would get something out of his like concepts of capitalist realism and depressive anhedonia. Uh, he essentially argued that young people were raised to believe that change was completely impossible and kind of resorted to completely ignoring politics as a result. And I guess that kind of that concept brings us full circle since I kind of I joined Rise with the hopes kind of breaking out of that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and you obviously mentioned that your uh, initial sort of phase into politics was through repeal and through climate action and all that and Mark Fisher. So with all the options of left wing parties, what made you then want to choose Rise? Well, I mean, to be honest, I fell into rise in a very kind of gradual way, which probably doesn't make a great answer. Like, I never woke up in the morning going to myself, ah, sure, I'll join Paul Murphy split, like, (laughs) even if that would have made my life way easier, like, like I've always kind of agreed with the direction Rise were headed in, but pre-COVID I was very shaky about being involved, mainly since I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I had like no real political experience at the time. Like around January of this year, my plan was just solely to like spend the remainder of my time at secondary school, like reading as much theory as I could and kind of getting involved in local activist work kind of in the area and climate issues and with the student union where possible, but kind of COVID pretty much killed that plan for me. Like the usher precarity the pandemic brought on had me questioning pretty much everything. And I kind of rapidly realized that I needed to get off the armchair and do things. Like the main reason I was very shaky about joining initially was this feeling that I was really incapable of doing much. I wouldn't be able to contribute in any real way. And COVID made me realize that uh, contributing in some way was way better than kind of just shying away. Like even if you're just editing a podcast or whatever, you're doing something. And that, and that kind of attitude kind of led to me joining the party around three months ago. And kind of the main reason I gravit- grav- gravitated towards Rice specifically was their approach to building movements. Like there's this counterproductive attitude in the left that you can't ever work with someone you disagree with. And that the, you can only really uh, prove yourself outside kind of from the sidelines shouting at people. And I think Rice kind of prioritizes actually being involved in movements and engaging with people, which is something Thing I largely agree with kind of based on my own experience and another thing that kind of led me towards joining RISE is how like they prioritize a uh, climate really because I feel like some parties on the left kind of hand wave it away with a oh sure we'll just do socialism and everything will be grand and I think RISE the fact they place emphasis on it is very important because it is kind of a definitive issue for us. Yeah of course um, with regards to that then though um, obviously you mentioned the climate justice being a core element of RISE it's obviously well it's in its pseudonym isn't it it's um, uh, environmentalism is the E in RISE. 
Um, what in general then has kept you involved in youth politics today? Well, I mean, to be honest, this is a bit of a hot take, but I wouldn't really use the label youth politics myself because I feel like in kind of our political establishment nearly just compartmentalizes young people and we're kind of our work is being treated as being separate from like actual politics. Mm -hmm. Like I'm the youngest member of RISE by nearly a half decade. Personally, I'd much rather just be sat in a room with a bunch of older people who kind of respect my viewpoint and listen kind of, as opposed to a room of kind of like young people who don't get listened to at all. Like kind of, like I feel like I'm involved in politics specifically to counter that compartmentalization. Like issues like austerity, health and housing will disproportionately hit young working people. I think that just being silent about it enables those in power to completely kind of ignore us nearly. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, actually, just on that, because that's a very interesting point, because it came up in the interview I did with Dar Adelaide, who's in PVP, um, and he was telling me like about how he feels like if there's a youth wing, um, they don't really feel like their voice is as heard as much because you can kind of shun it off as just being, well, that's the youth side of the branch, so we can kind of do what we want. And I think to a certain extent, that is true, and there are definitely big splits in parties that you can notice the youth voice is extremely different to the senior party. I think we've seen that very much with the Green Party. Uh, a lot of their younger members would very much be eco-socialists, but then when you go to the senior party, it's very much sort of centrist to almost centre right, and then some centre left. So it has that big change. So do you find then, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm getting from is that you find being in the same room as those people gives your voice more weight than if you were, say, part of a youth wing. Well, I mean, a lot of it kind of comes down to a difference in attitudes. Like something I'm, I kind of find very annoying is like some of the larger parties in this country are just very good at getting young people involved and then completely ignoring them. Like some of the larger parties in this country kind of treat their youth wings kind of like a glorified kind of nursery or recruitment agency or they're like to someone, oh, hey, you, we're not going to listen to anything you say on anything for the next five years, but eventually you'll get to be a county councillor in Clahine or whatever. So it's grand. <laughs> And I think kind of with like a uh, rise, something I kind of find very important is it's a very democratic party. You can argue out your viewpoint, you can have any perspective really. If you're able to, like, there's just open debate. And I know that word's kind of tired because everyone in youth politics goes on about debates, mm-hmm. but like, you're, op- you're able to openly kind of talk about your points, you're being, you're taken seriously. And even if you do kind of spur on an existential crisis when you talk about studying for a business exam or whatever, I do think kind of, I prefer being in that room and causing the existential crisis than not being listened to really. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming on from that point as well and almost adding to it with regards to politicians nowadays and we touched on it a little bit there um, from your own personal perspective in RISE do you find that politicians are beginning to listen to young people a lot more and then maybe looking at it from more of a broader scale of do you think politicians in general are listening to the general public of young people a lot more uh, again kind of this is a bit of a hot take but I think a very important distinction to make is that politicians uh, don't choose to listen to young people out like the goodness of their hearts or whatever they're kind of forced into it and i think the whole saga around predicted grades kind of serves like the perfect example of this like firstly i just have to say outright like major props have to be given to the issu and of other student activists for getting otherwise uninvolved six-year students advocating for predicted grades like i feel like genuine anger towards our education system was like perfectly channeled in a way the government could not fully ignore like uh, the government didn't really want to admit it like you could see kind of leaders bollocking the poll the day before they announced the cancellation but when you're faced with some form of crisis you usually end up going with the first option on the table and i think that like uh student activists managed to get that option on the table through sheer force by using our voices like even if the government wasn't very keen on listening to us and like to be honest i don't think we'll ever see the voting age being lowered to 16 for a while and kind of because of that i think that in order to get politicians to listen to us we need to organize outside the doll like as evidence kind of through the uk's failure of predicted grades like i think that politicians can fall into just automatically ignoring us because we can't vote which kind of necessitates kind of being there on the streets and kind of drawing their attention like the image of like other like hundreds of otherwise apolitical students kind of protesting in a socially distanced way probably kind of scared like the uh they just scared the tories kind of leading to them implementing reforms they wouldn't really have thought about maybe passing in the first place like i think kind of with the uh, current fiasco with predictive race there's something very important about students being there using our voices and getting ourselves heard because if we just leave them if we just leave it and we just kind of let politicians go on as they will they will just kind of fall into ignoring us really mm-hmm. Um, we spoke a little bit earlier on sort of universal aspects of politics, whether it be sort of the repeal of the Eighth Amendment was very much grassroots led. The climate strikes are very much grassroots led now as well. Do you think that there's any one aspect in politics that will attract young people to getting involved that doesn't include, you know, having to be part of a partisan party? 
I mean, to be honest, like the main thing I see is kind of fundamentally common with all aspects of youth politics, regardless of your position and spectrum, is the need for like further diversification. Like I feel at the moment, like a very specific demographic generally get involved in youth politics and that kind of, like, kind of limits our ability to enact change. Like it does kind of feel like a majority to the people in youth politics are the kind of person who have like a list like their top five Wikipedia pages and I fall into that of course I'm not going to pretend I, I don't but I feel like we need to get more students involved in our movements and the more people we reach out to and the more diverse we are the more well the easier it is the easier it is for us to really enact change and like a majority of young people at the moment feel completely apathetic about student activists because of feeling kind of incapable of enacting genuine change and I think as young activists we have to build structures and movements that get people out there involved in order to kind of force our government to listen to us like if we were able to get a majority of kind of sixth year students say involved in movements to lower the voting age against student fees against austerity and towards kind of a, a fair response to climate change i feel like that would lead to like a revolutionary shift in how young people are viewed in politics and it's something i think we could all kind of agree as being a good thing mm -hmm. of course um talking then on parties in general in the Dáil now I'm going to touch a little bit on uh, the fact that Paul Murphy is obviously a member he's the sole member of Rise in the Dáil but he does come under the Solidarity People Before Profit banner grouping in the Dáil so obviously he's working a lot with Breed Smith, uh, Richard Boyd Barrett, McBarry, the Socialist Party would you on the party level as a normal member would you be interacting a lot uh, with the Socialist Party and People Before Profit as well or is that grouping solely just sort of a Dáil thing? Well, kind of something about Rise's attitude is we want we were willing to work with anyone we agree with. Like even if we have minor disagreements, we believe it's more important to work together towards kind of common goals than just kind of sitting on the sideline denouncing people and selling new newspapers. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, personally, kind of we're still very, like I'm, I'm only after joining Rise very recently, but even then I've been kind of engaging well with the local branches of BVP. I've been like reaching out to local activists. And in general, our kind of position is like some parties on the left have this really bad habit of saying, oh, hey, our politics are better. We're going to prove this by just sitting in the sideline, kind of ignoring everyone else, kind of denouncing them when things don't go to plan. Mm -hmm. With RISE, our approach is more, we want to learn from movements. We want to kind of gain from, like, we don't have all the answers for everything. We, we're able to admit that. We're able to kind of work together with people and kind of learn and kind of get from that experience, really, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Uh, final question then for you is, uh, where do you see your future going? Uh, well, I know you don't like the term youth politics, but let's just say politics as a whole going in the future. Uh, to be really honest, I, I have really, I, the less of the future I have in politics, the better. Like I <laughs> kind of, I'm not involved politically for like personal gain or like enjoyment, but instead kind of to actively advocate for change. And if I could see that enacted, I'd probably just go live in the woods and write music again. But like uh, for me, kind of like something I find but like I'm like the attitude I take towards politics is probably slightly different from a lot of people. Like I, I remember being at some event like two years ago and hearing some lad like drone on about a county council seat he was gonna contest in five years' time. And I gave me that gave me a lot of dread. Like I like obviously there is importance in sitting and running in elections or whatever, but for me like I, I don't want to be a personality. I just want to enact change and be of some use to a larger movement nearly. Like I, I like I even if I wanted to, I would never be able to kind of sit in that oversized over Fianna Fáil recruitment chair, you know? Like my attitude towards politics is kinda it's it's different, I know, but like for me it's just more about enacting change and of being of some sort of use to a movement, I guess, even if that sounds like really sappy. Perfect. Kieran, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. No problem.